<laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Sweet. Uh, quick question though: Did you um, did you start the recording by any chance? The start broadcast button up at the top. I did. Yes. Okay. Sweet. Oh, oh that was awesome. <laughs> All right. So yeah. let's give him another round of applause and welcome back. Thanks, y'all. I'm glad to be with you. Um, yeah. So to start, just a little bit about myself. Um, so currently, I work for uh, these folks, Mass Relevance. We are located here in Austin, Texas. Um, we either build or power uh, experiences like this here for Major League Baseball, or this that you might have seen for uh, for the last Olympics, or uh, President Obama's Twitter town hall. Um, pretty much, if you see Twitter appearing on television, then it was probably us that was powering it. In fact, I think we are coming soon to your very own CBC. And uh, some of my previous gigs, um, also all these companies were either uh, located now or at one point in Austin. We also um, have this in common. We are all hiring thoughtful Ruby developers. So if you need a job, then I would recommend that you uh, learn Ruby. And another great reason is, of course, the, uh, the subject of today's talk. And so if you're here, you're off to a great start. Otherwise, you have probably been at it for years, and you just want me to shut up and get on with it. Right out. Here we go. So uh, as, as front-end developers, we, we kind of have a bit of a quandary. And that is that the amount we've needed to know over time in order to consider ourselves competent front-end developers has increased pretty substantially. So uh, back in 1995, right around the time that uh, my Alanis Morissette reference there would have been at all relevant, um, it was pretty much just HTML, right? It was paragraphs, lists, blank tags, you know, all that stuff. You are all set. And then in 1997, we've got CSS and JavaScript. We start thinking about separating our style from our content, making that content dynamic. And then in 2005, the term Ajax is coined and starts giving people headaches. And then in 2007, we have even more headaches with mobile development. And all right, 2000. 2013, we've got CSS3, HTML5. It's just a version bump, right? We're all set. Well, let's, let's start to unpack that a little bit. So CSS3 really comprises animation and 2D, 3D transforms and fonts. And HTML5, you've got this host of new semantic elements and local storage and video and audio and geolocation. And, JavaScript is MVC and AMD, and really it's just evolved into a series of acronyms at this point. Plus, you got the coffee script and the espresso script and the latte script, and you'll probably want to know about this stuff here as well, and maybe have a passing familiarity with all of these things. And then you've also got these libraries, and before you know it, you're dealing with a tag cloud, right? And as we know, everybody hates tag clouds, right? So hold on to your hats, folks, for this, this even more stunning conclusion. The explosive growth of the web has really dramatically increased the, the complexity of front-end development. And our tools haven't always really kept pace. So how do we start to tackle some of this complexity with a tool that we know well, Ruby? So let's, let's start from the foundations. Markup. So let's take a look at some HTML, some of the how to make a living. So this is a very simple example, and every element, as we know, has an opening and closing tag. So I've got my div here with a paragraph tag inside of it. And let's, let's take a look at a slightly more complex, totally contrived example. So I've got this div with an unordered list and a single list element inside, and it's got this span. But as I, as I look at this, I get concerned. Because do I, do I really need to be closing all of these tags, you know? Computers really ought to be able to figure this out for me. That's robot work. So it's not so much that it's a pain to write. I can configure my editor to close the tags, but it does clutter the document, makes it a touch more difficult to understand the structure if you're looking at a very large, very complex nested file, and just to read things generally. And since we spend most of our time reading code and not writing code, that's important. So one of the first attempts at tackling some of the complexity of markup with Ruby was Markaby. Now, this was released in 2006, and if you're fortunate enough to recognize that blog header there, you know it's from our very own Why the Lucky Stiff. If you don't recognize it and you don't know who I'm talking about, 
Google Wise Poignant Guide, get to know him. Um, the, the illustrations I used across this presentation were uh, borrowed from Y. Um, and as a quick aside, here's how dumb I am. I didn't notice until I was putting this talk together that the hands are in the background of the red-handed header there. That's, that's just how dumb I am. Anyhow, so we can see what he's doing here with the, with the Ruby is he's using it to capture and treat his links as strings, and he's appending those together with pipes, and then we get that little five gits, bits, and spec series of links in his header there. So if we take a look at that example from earlier, this is what it's going to look like in Marker Bean. So we see each element is a method. We're using blocks to nest elements and our content. Because it's Ruby, um, all of the blocks must be closed, right? So it doesn't really solve the particular problem of closing tags because we're still closing all of these blocks. So Python and other white space significant languages figured this out, right? So Hamel, which was also released in 2006 by uh, Hampton Catlin, and I believe it's maintained now by Nathan Weizenbaum, it added that sig concept of significant white space to the mix. So now I don't have to bother with closing all these tags. The Hamel interpreter just sees the indentation, recognizes the significant white space, and does the rest for me. So it also gives us a shorthand for things like IDs, classes, attributes, does lots of other cool stuff. So you can see up at the top there, I've got the div with an ID of comments. I'm using percent signs to denote uh, new elements. Um, the ul.fancy just means it's a ul with a class of fancy. I, I denote all of my attributes by using a hash there. And I, I don't want to start a religious war. I know that there are a lot of feelings about Hamel on, on both sides, but it's hard to argue that this isn't a much terser, assuming that terser is a word syntax. So an even terser syntax would be slim. Slim is a relatively new entrant onto the scene of Ruby HTML preprocessors, but it started as an experiment to, to see just how much code could be removed from standard HTML. So at first glance, we can see we've lost those uh, percent signs to denote new elements. Um, and really, this is just about the fewest number of keystrokes you can get to produce usable markup. Um, a few differences as well, where you're got a different style for denoting our attributes. But really, as we can see, Hamel and then Slim being the, the king of the terseness contest there. And really, these are all great ways to make it easier to comprehend the structure of our documents, to make them more readable, therefore more maintainable, and really just to allow us to write more markup faster. But we're not going to get through things with content alone, we also need to make sure our sites look nice. So good design helps with the success of any project, but sometimes our style sheets can get needlessly complex. So how can we start to simplify our style sheets with Ruby? Let's start by taking a look at uh, some of the problems with our beloved CSS. So if you talk to a neckbeard, uh, a, sorry, a wise learned coder about CSS, they always have some problems with it, right? It, uh, it doesn't do what they think it should. So what are some of those problems? Well, for starters, nesting, right? Why am I saying nav ul and then nav ul li? And I'm styling up a navigation element here. I don't, I don't need to be doing that. Um, and then variables, right? I've got this color red listed twice. What if I want it to be blue? I have to go through and find change for red? That's totally ridiculous. And functions. I don't have functions either, right? So enter SAS, which was given to us by the same folks that created Hamel. They, in fact, built it as Hamel for style sheets. Here we're looking at SCSS, which is SAS's cousin. It's actually now the default in new Rails projects. It allows us to do some really cool stuff. Like you can see I can nest my selector there. So rather than saying nav ul and nav ul li, I just nest it inside of that ul element. I can also nest my attributes. So rather than font weight, font style, and font size, I nest them there inside of that font block. I can also use variables. So I'll say, well, I want my text color to be red, and then I'll just use that text color variable in a couple of places. Then I can just make that change in one place, and you all know how variables work. I'll, I'll just skip over that. So variables are really where SAS starts to look like CSS from the future. 
Um, so if I've got this uh, callout div and I'm defining some attributes of its border, I can say I want it to have this particular color of green and then my default border width is five, five fixed, but inside of this callout div, I, uh, I want to multiply that default width by two, or I want to apply this darken function to that original color. Um, so then I can set this one kind of base color for a theme, and then by using these darken and lighten functions, I can just change, make one change to that color, and then essentially have reskinned my entire site. Mixins, these are the, the functions of SAS. So here I'm defining this uh, index table mixin. I'll say for index tables, I want everything in the header row to have a, a bold font, and I'll go ahead and zebra stripe that table. So then for my table with a class of users, I want that to just incorporate all of those styles. Now one project that makes heavy use of the mixin functionality and is built on top of SAS is called Compass. Uh, it refers to itself as a CSS authoring framework. So with Compass, we get a host of CSS3 mixins, layouts, some typography patterns. So let's take a look at some of this. So one of the really basic CSS3 mixins in Compass is border radius. So I've got this class of round in here, and I say uh, include that border radius mixin. Its default border, radi border radius will be 5 pixels, but since that's a mixin, I can actually have arguments and set that to 10 pixels, whatever. And then that's going to get interpreted down to the vendor prefix CSS. And this is actually one of several CSS3 mixins that we get out of the box with Compass. So what's really great about this is we know we're always using the most up-to-date CSS3 declarations. So when things like border radius get adopted by more browsers and we can start dropping vendor prefixes, we don't have to worry about it. We don't have to worry about copy-pasting prefixes all over the place. It's generally just much more readable and more maintainable CSS. Um, so SAS and Compass both offer some niceties for dealing with style, style sheets, but here's the real problem. What is this? Over time, you're working on a project and you just end up with these huge monolithic files for your style sheets. There's no real organization. Maybe you got some comments, but really it's just selector after selector and, oh, somebody thought to alphabetize them. Great. That makes a lot of sense. So nobody means to do this, right? It's just the sort of thing that happens over a time in a project. So how can we start to address some of this complexity? So this comes from a blog post from Chris Epstein called Help My Style Sheets Are a Mess. So here my example is uh, just a, an aside from the, the talk where I, or the conference where I originally gave this talk where the keynote speakers were Matt and Uncle Bob. So I've got my little side element. Um, and then the H2, an unordered list, and but it's not very cool, right? It's just, just, just default, just black and white. So let's, let's make this awesome. Bam! Slap some sass on that, and suddenly it's the coolest thing you've ever seen. But really, it's still just a mess of properties. I can alphabetize them, but really, it's not going to help all that much. So I've got all of this, the styles for this aside here. So let's, let's take a look at the typography. So I've got that font family declaration, and then the font weight, and the font size. Well, let's pull that out. Let's create this class highlight text, where I define the font, and it'll say what the, the size and the weight of my H2 elements. And then there in my side, I can just extend that highlight text class. So extend is just going to pull in all of those, dec all of those style declarations. So let's, let's go through again, and let's pull out everything that defines the container, like the box shadow, the border, the margin, the padding. We'll refer to that as a shadow box. And then let's define a dark background and a high contrast interface. So then when we look at this aside again, really it's just a series of extensions um, that are intelligently named, so it's much easier to comprehend the style, to comprehend the intent. And what's really cool is changes to those extended classes will now carry through the entire site. So my theme will stay consistent without having to go through and redefine these things in each one of these elements. So all I'm really doing here is defining how I want that UL to look, and everything else is very readable and thus much more maintainable. So if you want to create a new Compass project, you do it like this here, Compass, create my site. Here I'm just saying to use a Blueprint 
um, which is, if you're unfamiliar, it's the Blueprint framework. It gives you some sensible typography, some cross-browser grid layout, um, so you don't have to worry about box model stuff. Um, so to, to go over that one more time, when we're dealing with the complexity of our style sheets, we can use SCSS and Compass to kind of organize properties by container, by color, by typography. But when we're dealing with authoring abstractions like this, it's, it's really a lot of recompiling. Plus, we have linters, hinters, minifiers. It's, it's a lot of stuff to handle manually. So we need to automate our workflow. So a good way to do that with Ruby is with a gem called Guard. Guard is just a, a file system watcher. So it's super simple. I start out by setting up my Guard file in the root of my project. Um, and so I'll say Guard Slim. So watch all my files with the .slim extension. Guard Compass, watch all the files with the .css, .scss extension. And then run those commands um, to, to go ahead and compile those files anytime we see one of them change on the file system. Um, now, Compass does have Compass Watch, but this is nice because it's now part of a single automation suite that we've rolled ourselves. So what's really cool is when I bring new developers onto the project, I can just say bundle install, bundle exec guard, um, and they are all set. They, they've got their automation suite ready to go. Um, and if you check out this blog post here from Bidget, um, you can see they've got some just for things like uh, handling minification, retina images, sprites. Um, and there are also gems that uh, add support for all kinds of stuff, compiling coffee script, compiling Haml for doing live reload, for running uh, your hinters or linters, Jasmine tests. But sometimes your needs might be a touch more specialized. So at Mass Relevance, um, we build custom visualizations of social media data. So over time, there was a lot of code that was shared between projects, a lot of different toolings developers wanted to use to build out those visualizations. So we rolled our own gem. You can find it up on GitHub. It's uh, mass relevance slash vizr, V-I-Z-R. Um, now, the original version of this used Guard under the covers, but includes a lot of other tools that we needed on our own projects. Now, actually, uh, since I first gave this talk, this tool has kind of evolved um, to, to use uh, few tools that are, are pretty new onto the scene and are actually based on uh, JavaScript. So this will be a touch of a diversion from the original intent of the talk, but um, a lot of front-end automation in the community is moving this way, and it makes sense. Um, when we were dealing with project, projects that are mostly HTML and JavaScript, so those developers would like to keep their, their tooling in JavaScript as well. And uh, what were new projects at the time I gave the talk have now matured, and uh, we even rewrote our Visor project to make use of uh, Grunt and Bower. So uh, let's take a look at these. Grunt, um, when you're building a JavaScript library, you have, you know, you need to concatenate source files and compile CoffeeScript and run JS hint and minify things. And you can do this with a series of rake commands. And in fact, it's, it's really handy to just think of Grunt as rake for JavaScript projects. But uh, a lot of JavaScript developers would prefer to just do this with JavaScript. So this was released pretty recently, but it already has a huge community. Um, so you, it's very easy to incorporate plugins for Handlebars, CoffeeScript, Jade, RequireJS, all the hot JavaScript stuff the cool kids are using these days. Bower, or Bower, I actually have no idea how it's pronounced, um, is essentially uh, Ruby gems for JavaScript libraries. It's, it's just a package manager for front-end libraries. Um, there, this is very cool because really there was no standard way of doing this. It's essentially just copy down some files, stick them wherever you want them. But now I can just install the node package uh, Bower. I can say Bower install, which installs all my dependencies. And then I can go ahead and Bower install underscore to get the underscore library in there. It's a very, very cool project. It runs, uh, just runs over Git. Uh, it's package agnostic, so it can be AMD, require JS, power, doesn't care. And so to tie all this together is a, a tool called Yeoman. Um, this is released by Adi Asmani and several, several other people. Um, it uh, integrates Grunt and Bower into a really nice workflow. So what you can see here, I say Yo Web App, which is just scaffolding myself out a new site. Then I uh, npm install and Bower install, install all my dependencies. I say Bower install underscore again and score. Uh, install um, that, the underscore library for me. Um, and then Grunt 
which is just once again prepare everything for deployment. So Yeoman also does some other really cool stuff, uh, like handling image optimization, doing automatic compilation like Guard. It also has live reload integration. Um, so if you're looking to automate your workflow, which you should definitely do, saves you tons of time, um, you can either uh, do it yourself with Ruby, you can delve into JavaScript, or you can roll your own gem. So now that we've got uh, all of our components, let's, let's look at how we might build some static sites with Ruby. So Jekyll, if you are at all familiar with uh, Ruby static site generators, this is uh, one you will definitely have heard of. It, it builds itself as a blog-aware static site generator. Um, so super simple. Uh, it's just based on this um, YAML configuration file, and then I have this post directory. It's, uh, it's also the, currently the engine behind GitHub pages. If you haven't used it in GitHub pages in a long time, as I have not, uh, it's really cool. It has themes now, great for running your project page or portfolio page. Um, and under the covers, it uses the tilt gem to handle a variety of different markup formats and uses pigment for syntax highlighting for, for your blog posts. So um, if you're looking to build like a coding blog, you might want to look at uh, Octopress, which is very, very popular now. It's built on top of Jekyll. It has this really pretty default theme, uh, responsive layout, a sidebar with your tweets or your app.net updates if you're super cool, your GitHub repos. Now, Octopress takes a little heat sometimes because after it was released, a lot of blogs started to look suspiciously similar. Um, but much like Twitter Bootstrap, it's something that's meant to be themed. If you spend just a little bit of time on it, you'll end up with something that's really cool. Um, now, why would I want to host my blog as a static site? Well, for one thing, I used to work for Metasploit, so I just cannot bring myself to use WordPress ever again. But let's say you get slash dotted or hacker news, and you don't want to worry about your server melting, and this way you don't have to. You either throw it up on GitHub pages, you host it as a static site on S3, you let Discuss worry about their comment servers melting, and you are fine. So Middleman, this is one of my favorite uh, static site managers for Ruby. Um, now it brings all the template helpers, but also handles minification and cache busting and compression. Um, and it's also built on top of Padrino, which is another full stack Ruby framework uh, like Rails or Sinatra. So it gives us things that we'd be familiar with from Rails, like layouts, helpers, templates, partials. Um, these are all really handy things when you're building complex static sites. So uh, let's take a look at building a, a sample project with Middleman. So one project you might see yourself tasked with is building an API documentation site for your product. And this is the type of thing that is just a, a perfect fit for Middleman. So I've built one here you can take a look at. Uh, it's up on GitHub at techpiece slash API site base. So when I was creating this, I just started with a compass create API site base, and I want to use the bootstrap SAS gem. Here I'm just using Twitter bootstrap. Um, if you're unfamiliar with Twitter bootstrap, just very quickly, it was released by Twitter. It's just a series of reusable front end components for web applications. If you started noticing all web apps looking exactly the same, like all blogs were looking the same, it was because of Twitter bootstrap. Um, and I'm, I'm saying I want to use the SAS version of that rather than less as it's written in initially. And then I say middleman in it, this API site base. I have to move a few full, uh, files around into uh, the source directory. But once I'm done with that, I'm going to see this here, which even has this like cool animation effect, which makes you think, wow, I just did something awesome, even though really you just ran two commands and moved some files around. So here I've got the, the layout for the site, which once again is in slim. It's not important to read all of this, but because it's in slim, the markup is very clear, very concise. Um, and most of this, as you can see, is actually header. But up at the top there, I'm defining my body element. I'm sending the class to the result of the page classes helper. And then I'm rendering the partial nav bar. Um, the reason we see two equal signs there is because Slim escapes HTML by default. So by using the double equal sign, I'm saying, don't worry about escaping this and throwing up a bunch of puke on my site. So I've got my index template. Um, once again, very concise markup. I'm defining these rows, which is just uh, some layout helpers that Twitter Bootstrap gives us. The span 12 is just part of their grid system. Um, and then I uh, 
this gets dropped into the, the layout where we see that container div with a yield. This should be familiar to Rails folks. We're just yielding the result of that template. So let's take a closer look at that markup again. So I've got this div with a class of row and a class of wells, and I'm using this well helper method a few times there. So as you can see, what it does there is I, I pass in a header for the well. Um, a well is just another thing that Bootstrap gives us, kind of that rounded gray div that's offset from the layout a bit. So I pass in the, the header and then an image and then the text for the button there. Um, so if you look inside of that helper, this is just one cool thing that middleman gives us is access to the lorem ipsum gem. Um, so really, I'm just saying lorem.sentences3. Um, you can do lorem.paragraphs. Really cool helper. Makes it super simple when you're prototyping layouts like this and you just need some lorem text. So here is our finished product. Um, I, I put this together start to finish in about 30 minutes, um, for which for something that looks like this, uh, for someone like myself, who's typically not so great at visual design, um, in the past couple of years, uh, we've really advanced uh, the state of the art in terms of how quickly you can put prototypes together. Uh, like I said, this is up on GitHub to peruse at your leisure, IA. Right? And uh, hey, if middleman looks like it's not your bag, don't worry. Because in the Ruby world, you have got serious options when it comes to static site managers. Um, but, hey, static sites, they're not going to make me any cash, right? So who cares? Well, let me introduce you to a buzz phrase you may have been unaware of. Backend as a service, or BAS. Um, there's, there's another reason you might want to look at building a static site, and it's this right here. These folks will provide you with servers, with storage, and entire backend infrastructure. And a fair number of these providers have sprouted up in the past couple of years. Now, most of these are tailored specifically for mobile apps and provide SDKs for iOS or Android. But uh, one of them, Parse, actually has a, a JavaScript SDK. Now, it's still meant to be used for mobile apps, but we can use it to build a static site and that we're delivering the same static content to all our users that's still dynamic. So this means we'll be building the entire site in JavaScript and HTML. And the Parse SDK is actually based on Backbone. Since I am too lazy to build an example app from scratch, let's use the go-to resource for client-side MVC framework example apps. That is to-do MVC. So this is a resource built by Adi Asmani again and several other folks. And it attempts to take pretty much every uh, client-side MVC framework that exists and build the exact same to-do list application. It's, it's trying to be the Rosetta Stone of client-side MVC frameworks. So the app itself looks like this. Um, this is a really excellent resource for determining which MVC framework is going to fit your needs. Um, since they have a Backbone version, and since Parse is actually based on Backbone, it's really just a matter of converting the existing to-do MVC for Backbone over to Parse. There's actually a handy guide for doing this very thing over at the, uh, the Parse help site. So I start by creating my to-do MVC app. And we go ahead and gank all the code for the Backbone app from to-do MVC. I've got this up as well at GitHub at techp slash to-do MVC parse. Um, don't worry if you aren't familiar with Backbone. We're not going to dive into it too deeply. But we'll start off by including the parse JavaScript SDK. We'll call their initialize function with these super secret keys that no one else is ever going to see ever. And here we have our original model from the to-do app. So it has some default values, as we can see. We've got this toggle function that just saves the model and toggles that completed Boolean symbol. So to change this over to a parse object, we'll change backbone model to parse.object. Simple. Then we'll also uh, add the class name to do, so it knows where we're going to map that on the, the parse backend. So step three, let's take this to-do list backbone collection, and we'll change that to parse.collection. All right, that was it. And then step four. OK, we are done. Wonderful. So let's go ahead and deploy this thing. Now this is going to be super tough. I'm going to click Continue. 
And I'm going to sync that folder up to S3, and then it is deployed. OK, so that took a few seconds. This is the coolest part of backend as a service providers. Um, this site right now is hosted on S3. The deployment takes milliseconds, and we don't have to worry about it falling over suddenly if everybody's like, oh, holy crap, check out Matt's to-do list. It's the coolest thing. Um, this is a really powerful paradigm. As more and more services like this come into being, we're going to have new ways to think about architecting our applications. So if you want to check that out for some reason, it is at todo.matthewbuck.com. Um, this is a really simple example app. There's no concept of users. Everyone can see everyone else's to do. So go in there and start uh, typing out curse words for everyone else to see. Uh, just be sure to refresh because it doesn't pull and refresh mercilessly. Um, I don't care. I don't ha host the front end or the back end myself. I host nothing. So since I initially wrote this presentation, um, another new service that has come onto the scene, uh, back end as a service provider, is Backlift. Uh, this one is super, super cool. So let's, let's try that whole process again, this time using Backlift. So we'll start by signing in, linking it to my Dropbox account. We'll see why that is here in a moment. All right, step one. I will create a new app. Wonderful. Step two, use the Backbone to do template. Wonderful. Step three, oh, okay, no step three even. It's two steps, bam, done. To do MVC is up. So uh, this is super, super cool. It's um, It creates a folder on my Dropbox account, creates that same to do app. And so we see it here inside of my Dropbox folder. I can just go ahead and open that up. Inside of there, I'll open that index.html, and I will just change that header from to-dos to super awesome to-dos. And then the process of deployment is um, save. I save the file. Then Dropbox syncs the file, and it is up. The change is reflected instantly. Uh, this is really, really neat. Um, if This really changes the game uh, in terms of you know throwing up super quick prototype sites. Um, they, I, I was unable to find any pricing information. Uh, it's, it is a very new service, um, but definitely worth checking out. Uh, these backend as a service providers, like I said, are really going to change the game in terms of the way we, we think about architecting our applications. So to go over that one more time, if we're building uh, static sites, then uh, Jekyll is the engine for GitHub pages, a great option for blogs, as is Octopress. You can use middleman for managing a uh, static site, or you can use parse or backlift uh, as a, uh, a backend as a service provider. And that is it, folks. Thank you so much. And uh, I'll go ahead and take any questions if you want to demute yourselves there. All right. <laughs> cool, cool. So you do have a few minutes for questions? Definitely. All right, All right thanks. Uh, any questions, anybody? Uh, did you hear that? I did not. OK. Uh, they were asking if the slides are going to be available. Yes. In fact, they already are. They are up on speaker.com. Um, if you just search for my name, tech piece, um, up on speaker deck, you usually find them. I will go ahead and uh, update a few of them. I'll go ahead and upload the most recent version. All right, thanks. Any other questions? Um, so I got one. Um, there's a lot of stuff at the beginning there with the different um, potential toolkits you can use. And like choosing the slimmest thing isn't necessarily always the best choice. So what's your your actual ideal setup right now? Um, I, I do actually uh, I prefer to use Camel projects just because um, it's uh, I think when you're evaluating any open source tool, obviously the size of the community is very important. Um, and really, that's while I really like Slim, um, 
I, I take comfort in knowing that there are uh, a lot more people working on the project. It's been around a lot longer, um, and uh, it, it's easier to get my questions answered. So I, I tend to stick with Hamel. Um, Hamel and SCSS are, are my go-to right now. Cool. Uh, I'll ask you another one. <laughs> Do you have any other, um, like, what's your favorite, like, little lesser known technique that you use right now with, either with, it could just be with the front end stuff or just general Ruby uh, tips or advice? Um, hmm. That is a good question. I don't, I can't really think of anything off the top of my head that's uh, lesser known, really. I kind of covered everything that I know. I'm not very smart. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, cool. Uh, anybody else talk with anything? Oh, uh, we got one coming up. If you like the uh, fact that Hamel does not have uh, ending statements, why do you prefer SCSS over SAS? Even it's very similar to the difference between S HTML and Hamel. Yes, that's a good point. Um, really, the only reason I, I go with SCSS um, is because now that it's the Rails default, um, I can expect more projects, more gems that interface with Rails to uh, use SCSS themselves. And when I bring new developers onto my team, I would expect more of them to be familiar with the SCSS syntax over the SAS syntax. Um, but that is that is a good point. Yeah, definitely. If, if you're looking for the, the terseness and the readability, then SAS is a fine option. Um, for me, it, w it really just came down to what can I expect developers to know and what is going to be more widely supported by the, the community. Cool, thanks. Another, oh, another question coming up? Uh, what is your preference between EmberJS and AngularJS? Um, honestly, I uh, really only started looking at both of these projects. Um, from my initial work with both of them, I would say that AngularJS at this point just seems easier to get started with. I know there's been a, a touch of drama around Ember recently with regards to their kind of getting started documentation. Um, I'm sure EmberJS is going to be a super cool project. Um, and once they kind of address that issue and it's the, the API is a touch more stable, um, I think it will be very cool. Uh, I think if I was going to do a side project where I wanted to toy with one right now, I'd probably use Angular um, just because it would be easier for me about having to totally rewrite it in a couple of months. Thank you. Uh, any other? I got it. Uh, what do you think of Meteor? 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 Yeah. Um, I, I think it's awesome. That's another one where uh, I, I really just started looking at this stuff. Um, I've been paying attention to it for a while. I think what excites me about Meteor is it kind of makes me feel the same way I did when I watched like the, the blog in 15 minutes video, which is what got me started with Rails. Just like, oh, wow, this is probably the future. I <laughs> should. I should probably learn this stuff. Um, I know when I first looked at it, there were a lot of concerns around kind of data security and things like that, which all seem to have been addressed. Um, I think actually my next kind of investigation spike side project thing will probably be with Meteor, um, just to kind of start getting a feel for that and deciding if I need to learn it so that I can have jobs in the future. Questions, anybody? Not see any more questions. Do um, you have any final words of wisdom for the group? Um, you know, just uh, keep keep trying to stay one step ahead. I think as Rails developers, what's really cool about this community is we try to stay on the cutting edge. Um, so if you're here to use the group, um, you're you're obviously interested in doing that. So yeah. Just try to see what's coming around the bend, stay on top of stuff, and keep making awesome things.
Oh, one more question, sir. Yes. Yes. Did you hear that, or I didn't quite hear that. It's memorized for us. Um, Sue is asking about stuff like SAS and uh, stuff like that that are compiled at the end before being pushed to the server. How do you de debug it? Was it? Was, did you want to maybe? Oh, well, I'll define like exactly. <coughs> is, is, is is it generating info or like clean HTML? CSS so, is the, sorry, is the question how do you debug the stuff that's been processed? Uh, yeah, and he's asking if it if it ends up being clean code at the end as well. Um, so there are different flags you can use for the different processors. So you can either say output minified code or output indented code. Um, I find it to be very clean. Um, one way you can kind of address the problem of debugging is something that really is just starting to make its way into the browsers, and that's called source maps. So um, I know there have been a few blog posts recently about how you can enable source maps in Chrome developer tools. And so that would then, uh, it just creates this mapping file. So I can, when I inspect an element, rather than showing me the line in the compiled CSS where it's defined, it will actually show me the line in my pre-compiled SCSS, and it will do the same thing with CoffeeScript as well. Um, so that's really starting to kind of address that concern people had. Um, I found that to be more of a problem, I guess, with uh, styles than I ever did with CoffeeScript, just because it's easy to tell by looking at the compiled JavaScript where my problem is usually. Um, but the source maps definitely helps a lot with that. Thank you. Any other questions? No? All right. Well, thanks so much, Matt. We really appreciate you taking the time out to to come and talk with us. And that was that was great. Thank you so much. Yeah, sure. Thanks for, thanks for having me. All right. Well, let's give him another round of applause. All right. Thanks. Cool. Have a great night. Thanks a lot. Yes, it is. All right, take it easy.